This is News 8 on Wood TV, honoring black history. The land of the free was built on the backs of enslaved Africans, black people who were dehumanized, beaten and killed because of the color of their skin. While there's a lot of pain that lies within the black story, there's also a lot of beauty in it. And tonight we celebrate that. Good evening, everyone. I'm Whitney Burney and I'm Donovan Long. Thank you so very much for joining us for this year's celebration of black history. We often study and reflect on the more prominent black icons discussed in our history books. But tonight we're focusing on a woman who doesn't get much recognition. News 8's Lindsay McComel introduces us to a West Michigan woman who more than a century ago had an impact felt well beyond our state. If you find yourself at Silverbrook Cemetery in Niles, Michigan, you might not even notice Lottie Wilson Jackson's gravesite. Her faded name etched in stone, a reminder of the century that's passed since her death, and a symbol of a legacy not widely chronicled in history lessons. So much of women's history is unknown. Women have always done some incredible things. It hasn't always been documented. Charlotte, her birth name, was born in 1854. She began shattering glass ceilings as a young, talented artist, the first black woman to attend the Chicago Art Institute at just 17 years old. In order to really appreciate Lottie Wilson Jackson, we really have to put in context into the time period in which she lived. By the time she became an adult, at 17, slavery had just ended. It would take several years, but her talent took the Niles native where her childhood home still sits and put her on a national stage. She was prominent even in white circles of, uh, as far as her art was concerned. She was an incredible artist by all accounts. And so she, was used, she definitely used that notoriety. Making headlines as an artist also catapulted Wilson Jackson into headlines as a civil rights activist, long before many of the giants in the movement were even born. She was a delegate for several national associations. She was a delegate for the Colored Women um, Club Association. She was a delegate for the National American Women's Suffrage Association. Balancing her activism and art meant traveling the country. If there wasn't room, she was subjected to traveling in trains with cattle or uh, traveling in trains with equipment. This really affected her because, again, thinking about the time period, this is now after slavery, but also after the Reconstruction era. So we're smack dab at the beginning of Jim Crow America. Her experience led to asking for change at the 1899 National American Women's Suffrage Association convention held inside St. Cecilia's in Grand Rapids. Her attendance and proposal was reenacted two years ago during the Greater Grand Rapids Women's History Council suffrage centennial. I submit a resolution that color women ought not be compelled to ride in smoking cars and that suitable accommodations should be provided for them. There was lots of discussion about it, but the problem was that the National American Women's Suffrage Association, NASA, needed the support of Southern women. And Southern women, they absolutely refused to hear um, her resolution. She didn't let that deter her, though, and went on to receive support from prominent minority organizations before reintroducing it. Then, a few years later, her most widely recognized accomplishment shattered another glass ceiling. Her replica of a painting depicting President Abraham Lincoln and Sojourner Truth was accepted as part of the White House collection, the first black artist to achieve such an honor. She presented that portrait to uh, president Roosevelt, she actually met the president. She went to the White House. You can say her legacy is preserved in that portrait and at her final resting place, where she was buried in 1914, bookending 60 years of trailblazing across the country. There are so many shoulders that we stand on that are unknown and are very little known about them. And I think Lottie Wilson Jackson is one of those people. Lindsay McComel for News 8. 
Tonight, we're also learning about the contributions of a black woman from Grand Rapids who made strides in the medical world. Loni Clinton Gordon helped to refine an already existing vaccine for whooping cough. At the time, the disease was still killing thousands of children and adults every year. Born in 1915 in Arkansas, Loni Clinton Gordon soon found herself living in Grand Rapids. She attended South High School, went to Michigan State University, then moved south. After discrimination forced her to leave a job in Virginia, she moved back to Grand Rapids where she would meet doctors Pearl Kendrick and Grace Elderling, two women who began developing a vaccine for whooping cough in 1932. They have an effective vaccine. They're looking to make it even better. And to do that, you have to isolate a strand of the bacillus. Clinton Gordon was hired in 1944 to make the vaccine more effective against new strains of the deadly virus, a task difficult for even the top scientists. She isolated the particular strand of um, pertussis, which was then used to make even more potent vaccines. She said, it's a wonder I still have eyes. Pertussis is a very, very persnickety organism. GVSU professor Carolyn Shapiro Shapin interviewed Clinton Gordon in 1998 about that work. Because thousands of children, as I said, were dying by the day in those days because they did not have any help. They needed a vaccine, but they couldn't find get a vaccine. An audio clip of that interview now lives at the Grand Rapids Public Library. Her story basically for me is that when labs hire people according to talent, regardless of who they are, but when you hire according to talent, you get talent. Mm -hmm. And therefore the vaccine is made better because of her work. Clinton Gordon is now one of three women permanently carved in downtown Grand Rapids. These are women who the honor was the recognition of their peers and the recognition that they were doing something important to save children's lives. And these are women and I'm not the first to say this, who would have been very surprised to find themselves in bronze. Whitney Burney, News 8. About 35 miles east of Ludington, tucked away in Lake County, Idlewild has become known as the resort town built by segregation. News 8's Jacqueline Francis shows us how that community gave black people a place to thrive. <laughs> Founded in 1912, Idlewild was one of the first African-American resort towns in the country. The Lake County community offering black families a place to relax and unwind during a time when most vacation spots were white only. They had nowhere else to go. Um, these were African-Americans who were seeking to have somewhere to go for the summer just like everyone else. And they were shunned and not welcomed at the other resort areas. Um, so then when this came along, it was like, wow, you know, we have something of our that we can call our own. West Michigan author Rose Hammond has helped chronicle the town's storied past. By the 1920s, Idle Wild was known as the premier summer vacation spot for prominent black families. Days were spent swimming, boating, and horseback riding. Nightlife would soon follow the opening of clubs and entertainment venues featuring top African-American performers. By the mid-50s, the booming resort town would draw 25,000 visitors on any given weekend, marking the height of Idlewild's rise to popularity. I don't know when they really recognized it um, because they were just enjoying themselves. They just couldn't believe that all these cars backed up behind each other, people sleeping in cars, that this was happening, you know, because it was something that they could call their own. The passing of the 1964 Civil Rights Act ended legal segregation. With it came the decline of African-American resort towns like Idlewild. Never dawned that they would have the day uh, once Civil Rights Act was passed, just never dawned that they'd be able to go somewhere else. Once you've been told you can't have, and now then you build your own, and now you're told, oh, wow, I can go to the Holiday Inn. I can go here, and entertainers too. I can go here, I can go here now with the passing of the Civil Rights Act. Still home to a few, but nothing like it was, Hammond still holds on to hope for the comeback of historic African-American resort towns like Idle Wild and nearby Woodland Park in Nuego County, imagining a resurgence that embraces the town's cultural and historical significance. No matter what, it's always gonna be Idlewild and Woodland Park. They're always gonna be two of the country's first African-American owned and operated resorts. That will never be taken away from them. And that's what I would really, I'm really proud of. Reporting in Idlewild, Jacqueline Francis, News 8. 
When you think about black history and culture in West Michigan, you might not think about a barber shop. Yeah, one of Grand Rapids' first black business owners ran a barber shop in what was the first in a long line of safe havens in the black community. News 8's John Dommel has more. We don't think of a barber like uh, Jeff Bezos, but in his community, people thought of him like a Jeff Bezos. In the late 1800s, a black man named J.C. Craig ran one of the most prominent barber shops in downtown Grand Rapids, now honored in an exhibit at the Public Museum. J.C. Craig was um, like uh, so many uh, post-Civil War African Americans moving to cities, starting businesses, uh, organizing themselves uh, uh, to fight for their own civil rights. He was in prime position to broaden the city's societal norms. Craig was in the back of the gun store upstairs, uh, and, but it was right at the center of town. It was at Monroe and Fulton. The absolute freedom found in the barber shop gave everyone a voice, from the big shots and the leaders to the workers and the hustlers. They all met in the barber shop. They're the second best thing to a therapist. <laughs> It's been a safe haven to, to have free expression. Um, it's uh, to express your blues, express your joys. It's a staple of black culture that continues to thrive today. It's more than just a cut with a lot of people, man. You know, some people come here just to release, you know what I'm saying, energy, bad energy, you know what I'm saying, bounce off good energy. Randall's been cutting hair for 36 years. So let's just say he's heard his share of stories. You'd be surprised, man, how many people have, um, you know, just negative energy. Wake up with an argument, feeling bad about the night before, and they get a chance to get some coming here and just, you know, get a different view of how they feeling. And that's a safe way because you send people out into the street with that energy and you don't know what happens. J.C. Craig actually helped mostly white customers at the turn of the 20th century. And in that time period, it put a lot more pressure on his position. See, I come up in a different day, so it's like, you know, my whole life I've been servicing both white and black. So, you know, and to think of it back then, I, I, can't, I can't even imagine to, you know, think what that was like. And more than 100 years later, the culture of the barbershop in Grand Rapids remains just as important. Work, just, just everyday life, you know what I mean? Just be somebody to talk to and get different perspectives on different things. When barbershops were closed for that period of time there, I mean, did it make life a little bit rougher? It did. <laughs> I was, my head was looking rough. <laughs> like you said, over 100 days, that's a long time without a haircut, man. That's, that, was, that was rough. I knew he was going to say his head was looking back up. <laughs> <laughs> what can generations going forward here learn from J.C. Craig? What we can learn is that even the smallest business owner can advocate for justice. Uh, they can uh, promote uh, goodwill between people, and that's what he did. Coming up next, we take a look at civil rights champion Sojourner Truth's legacy in West Michigan. We talk with the Grand Rapids man who was related to her and show how the pioneer's legacy continues after the break. The legacy of civil rights champion Sojourner Truth has deep roots here in West Michigan. It was Battle Creek that Truth called home for decades. We got a chance to speak with a Grand Rapids man who's one of her descendants. News A's Ruben Juarez shows us how the pioneer helped to shape his life. She had done so much over her life, lifetime and, and different things. Earl McLeishy Jr. can sit down inside his home and talk all day long about Sojourner Truth. Her fight for women's rights and human rights is that's why she's in Washington, D.C. right now. He has a room full of pictures and books commemorating the abolitionist and women's rights activist. I'm sixth generation grandson of Sojourner Truth and, um, and very proud of that. The Sojourner Truth, Sophie, Fanny, Thomas, Burrow Sr., Burrow Jr., so sick. As a second grader, McLeishy suffered a seizure. I was laughed at and teased and everything. I wouldn't go back to school. His teacher gave him a book about truth. Read that book with me and said, if she had the strength to do what she did, you got to have that same strength in you because of who you are. You have our bloodline. 
McLeishy returned to school. He pursued athletic endeavors, eventually playing minor league baseball. Later in life, he dedicated his time to being a speaker, sharing a truce story. They put a tear in the table there and says, and Mr. McLeishy, can you sign autographs? I'm like, you know, what? His next project, putting his family story on screen. We did a family documentary this summer, which should be coming out in a couple months. We want to take the time now to reflect on civil rights icon Malcolm X. He had strong roots in Lansing, spending much of his childhood in our capital city. Sarah also reports from our sister station in Lansing. Malcolm X Street. This sign is one way Lansing honors the civil rights activist who walked these same streets 93 years ago. But back then, he was known as Malcolm Little. The Little family purchased a house up in the Westmont subdivision up by what's today the airport off of Grand River Avenue. Malcolm X was born in Nebraska and moved to Lansing at two years old with his parents. His father, Earl Little, moved them to a predominantly white neighborhood. And within a year of moving there, the little house burned to the ground, um, most likely a arson attack by, by white supremacists. This is where one of Malcolm X's houses was located, right where this auto body now stands. They would eventually move to a house that his father built, but soon after they moved in there, they experienced a big loss. Unfortunately, later that fall, his father was, was found dead on the railroad tracks at Michigan Avenue and, and Detroit Avenue. Malcolm's mom was eventually sent to a mental institution. Malcolm and his siblings were put in foster care. He moved out of Lansing after junior high and would go on to become a civil rights activist. The number one domestic problem facing America is the race problem. And he even came back, speaking on the campus of MSU in 1963. Malcolm did this despite all of the obstacles, despite being African-American in Lansing in the 1930s. Some of the conditions that, that Malcolm wrote about and protested about are, are still with us. Coming up, a Grand Rapids mom dresses up her daughter as prominent black people in history. We hear from that mom about this tradition and how she's teaching her child to love who she is. One Grand Rapids mom is celebrating black history with a special game of dress up. Every day, you can find five-year-old Paisley Trotter on her mom's Facebook, dressed as a different black person in history. Taylor Trotter started dressing up her daughter three years ago. Her daughter Paisley has been just about everyone, from Wilma Rudolph to Nelson Mandela. Her mom says it's all about learning to love who she is. Five-year-old Paisley Trotter. I'm super excited. <laughs> is learning she can be anything or anyone she wants to be. I just really wanted her to make sure that she loves both sides of herself and loves who she is. From Sojourner Truth to Stokely Carmichael to Viola Davis and Kamala Harris. Every day in the month of February, the five-year-old and her mom take to Facebook posting side-by-side -side photos of Paisley dressed as different black trailblazers and teaching others their story. A tradition three years running. What do your classmates think when they see you on Facebook? Do they see you on Facebook? They say it's pretty much super cool. At the end of the month, all of the photos are put into a book. This year, they're also using their annual Black History Month project to pay special tribute to black lives lost to police brutality. Paisley learning the stories of people like Breonna Taylor and George Floyd. You know, if she's old enough to experience the racism, which, you know, unfortunately we have a couple times, um, kids are old enough to learn about it. So I just wanted to educate her now and say, you know, you never know the intentions. The world may perceive you differently just because of the color of your skin. Trotter says she realizes Paisley's experience as a biracial child will likely be much different from her own. She says she wants her daughter to have the tools to navigate hate and inspiration to keep moving forward like all those who came before her. So just learning that and like kicking down the glass ceiling, like when you get there, it doesn't mean that you need to be stopped. Like you go through those barriers and you can do whatever you want as long as you have that mindset in life. 
Now, Taylor tells me on the very last day of every February, she has Paisley dress up as herself to remind her that she is black history too. Whitney, what a remarkable way to sort of just educate herself about where she comes from. It's amazing and she was so too cute too. <laughs> Super adorable. <laughs> Before we part, we do want to leave you with a quote from a local activist. She says, slavery is white history. How we made it is black history. That history is being created every single day and expands far beyond the borders of the United States. So be proud of that history and all of those who came before you to create it. From Malcolm X to Angela Davis, from Frederick Douglass to John Lewis and countless others. Thank you to the trailblazers and powerhouses who brought us this far. Their work continues from here.